and I'm delighted to welcome Catherine Stott. Uh, uh, Catherine teaches at the Norwegian Academy of Music in Oslo. Also, she's the international chair at the Royal Northern College of Music and will teach there from September. And of course, she's a really a fantastic international concert pianist. Uh, so it's absolutely delightful to have you here, Catherine. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Yulia. I'm looking forward to our chat. Yes, and um, if you don't mind me asking, um, how has the, this situation affected you? I know that you have been performing so, so much. Um, so now, of course, is the time you find yourself at home. Yeah, I have to say, it's pretty strange to be at home. I think it's probably the first time, it's maybe the first time in my whole life I've been at home this long. That sounds really crazy, doesn't it? Because even as a as a child, I went uh, to study at the Menuhin School. So I was away from being eight years old, and then I was away at college, and then I was kind of professional from being quite young. And I think even when I had my daughter, I was not uh, at home as much as this. So it's um, it's pretty strange, and it seemed to happen. I, I think what took me by surprise with this whole. Um, COVID business was that it, it seemed to, the impact seemed to happen very quickly. And I was still traveling a lot in um, February and March. And actually I was in Australia in, Mar in, eight, um, in February, sorry. And there was talk of the virus then and I was aware of it. And I remember packing some masks with me and I thought, I, I don't know what's going on with this virus, but I'm, I may, maybe I just need this to have these with me. But, you know, we were just kind of continuing as normal. I started to, to, to take care of hands a little even more, I think, you know, a little bit more sanitizing the hands started. And by the time I came back from Australia, which was very early March, on the way back coming through Dubai Airport, I, think, I thought to myself, I think I need to put my mask on. I, I just suddenly felt there's a lot of people around. I'm not sure what's going on exactly. I maybe hadn't taken it quite as seriously as it was. And then got home and immediately went to Oslo because we were doing auditions for new students. And then we were like pretty much on alert. I remember that this was still very early March and, and, and cleaning down the keys between uh, every candidate. I mean, when I think what we were doing and we were all like squashed in quite small rooms and everything, you know, when I think about it now, I get very nervous. Yeah. Uh, but somehow we, we, we kind of survived that week. But while I was there, I suddenly thought, oh, things are escalating very quickly. And a concert I was supposed to go to in Oslo that evening got cancelled. Suddenly, you know, you could only be with so many people. And, um, you know, if you went for dinner, you had to be distanced already. And I suddenly said to my students, I'm cancelling this day's teaching. I got on my phone, I bought a ticket within kind of minutes wow. and I left. And I think by the next day, uh, lockdown happened in Norway. So it happened super fast. And, and the feeling of being home then was just like, well, I wonder what's going to happen. But it was strangely nice just for, in, in that sounds absolutely ridiculous now, doesn't it? But there was something about, okay, well, I'm going to be home now. I'm going to be cooking. I'm going to be doing ordinary things, things that I usually just do, but always have to rush off. So I never actually kind of feel I'm going to be stable for very long. And then the UK lockdown happened and then it, it suddenly felt quite different. Hmm. So I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a very strange thing. So the, 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 the rhythm of life has been very weird you know because we're always on the move aren't we we're always kind of getting ready to go somewhere and um, I think even with the teaching in Oslo I usually go there every couple of weeks so that that has its own little routine and then with the concert so I've actually felt that I've been traveling too much and in fact I will only teach in Oslo one more year and I'm, I'm not happy to leave that position because I've had a wonderful time there but I do feel it's not quite right to be traveling 
to That's teach so right mm -hmm. so okay. actually traveling when i can travel 20 minutes to the Royal Norfolk college um in manchester from where i from where i live actually makes much more sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's maybe in hindsight thinking all these things but i've heard of a few people now starting to think about how much they travel and yeah. maybe maybe this is the moment for us all to kind of just rethink a little bit how we do yeah. things I may ask you, so you, I mean, you know, you really perform so much and you travel so much. So if you take, um, let's say, a week or a month of your sort of really busy schedule, what did it look like before? <laughs> well, teaching is one thing, but yeah, but perform performing is another. So uh, lots and lots of hours of practice, I guess, you know, because there's always a lot of preparation to do for concerts um and then I, I could pretty much be anywhere i suppose is the thing so you know that seems a very uh, distant thought at the moment so yeah too much too much time in airports but you know lots i i love performing i don't want to perform i think in the past 18 months I've been quieter performing than I have in the past. So uh, 18 months ago I turned 60 and I decided to treat myself to a sabbatical and then actually kind of extended it a little bit. Um, I just felt I still wanted a little bit more time and that was actually really nice. So I, I still felt to be busy because I was traveling with the teaching but um, performance wise it was good to just kind of stop so maybe i feel like i'm just kind of in a permanent sabbatical now a little bit you know um yes but i, I guess like all musicians you know it, it's always been about what's in what's coming up in the diary and and the preparation for that and, and your whole life is a, is around those dates in a way you know when you will have to have that repertoire ready how you will prepare it and um, I'm, I'm planning into the distance and that's sometimes annoying because sometimes you don't want to plan 18 okay. months ahead or two years ahead, and, but you have to. May I go back to your uh, childhood years and maybe you can uh, tell us um, sort of what got you into playing the piano? Seeing a piano in my house. <laughs> um, my, my mother was a part-time um, piano teacher, just, on, just for kind of tiny, tiny kids. And we had a little um, upright piano in the house. And I, I've often thought, you know, just wondered what would have happened if it hadn't been there. So it was there. And I just made friends with it sort of pretty quickly. Um, I, learned, I learned to read music very fast. I, I don't know how, I just did. Mm -hmm. And I had no patience with anything. I was just wanted to next piece and next piece and never wanted to practice much and probably like lots of other kids um but it developed quite quickly mm -hmm. and um I, I think i picked it up very quick my mum tried to teach me at the beginning but that didn't work out too well and then i had some local teachers and then i went to the menuing school when uh, i was eight that must have been really strange because it's a quite a tough boarding school, you know, full on music. Did you feel that was the right choice? Because almost, uh, almost, it's almost, it's like your your destiny has been decided when you were eight. I know there are some people that go there um, and decide not to become musician, but it's just the the case with the Manion School that it's a professional specialist music school. Yeah, it was, I, I totally loved it when I was young. I, I, I thought it was really great fun. <laughs> it was in the countryside and that I thought was great. Um, I was perfectly happy. Um, I, I got more unhappy the older I got there because I, was a, I felt a little bit claustrophobic and it was small and I wanted to be out a little bit more at the age of 15 and 16. Um, but yeah, I had I had a mixture of very positive and and I mean influences that have stayed with me all my life. I think, but also quite a difficult time with certain teachers there. So it was a mixed experience. But I think as a youngster, I was 
I was quite happy and somehow just, I've never stopped for two, or I certainly never stopped during that time to think, did I want to be a musician? So everything kind of, you know, followed on from, I decided to leave though at 16 just because I'd kind of had enough. So it was a little bit early, probably it would have been expected I stay another year. And then from there, I went to Royal College of Music in London. And during that time, got a prize in the Leeds mm -hmm. International Piano Competition. And so then everything kind of just went very fast. And after that, maybe three years into that, that was the time I stopped and actually properly stopped. I cancelled everything and stopped and thought, I don't know if this is for me, because I think up until that point, I'd never thought about it. Could I just, um, because there's so many things I would like to, in, in this um, sort of story, I'd like to pick up, because I think we all know how important it is to have a good teacher. And um, it seems that you had a little bit of a trouble with some. So could you elaborate on that and say what was troubling? And um, was it not helpful or was it just you? I think it's very interesting, actually. I think it was more the situation um, at the school that we had a kind of, we had a regular teacher and then we had lots of visiting teachers and the two didn't often go together. Mm -hmm. So there was too much information, two too opposing views, mm -hmm. uh, different, different approaches, both of which were really good, yeah. but neither really appreciated the other one. And I think when you have two lessons a week with a kind of regular teacher, if they don't like this visiting teacher, sure. um, as, as a eight, nine, ten and onwards uh, little girl, you really don't know what to do. And, you know, you would kind of get immersed into one way of playing. And then as soon as that person had left the school, it was, OK, let's forget all about that then and go back <laughs> I go back to another way of playing and then just before they came back you'd have to try to remember how that was so actually that's pretty traumatic right. and it was very unstable and um, difficult to navigate I think so it, I, I, I didn't really get I didn't really feel on the right track until I got to Royal College wow and study with uh, Kendall Taylor wow. because he realized he realized that yes I knew something about that kind of technique or, or, or that style of playing or whatever it was and he realized I also knew about the other side of things that my, my regular teacher was telling me yeah but nobody had thought to put all these things together and actually I needed all of them but I was completely fragmented and and had no confidence I think because I, I didn't know where I was and I sort of left that uh, left school feeling I wasn't sure what I if I was good enough or if I could do anything or it just was kind of slightly messed up with myself even though I'd had like some incredible experiences with wonderful teachers there yeah yeah so, I yeah, it, I think I'm just forever grateful to him, to Kendall Taylor, of thinking, mm -hmm. yes, you can. First of all, you can do anything. So that was one of the first things I'd never heard that in my life. So that was that was good. That was a good start. And then, but he was he was fairly tough on me at the same time. He expected a lot, but it, he he just kind of rebuilt me, I think, and uh, and, and we just we just put all those ingredients together. But he also expected me to work incredibly quickly. And I'd never had that before. Mm -hmm. So at Menuhin School, we'd often spend, oh, I remember Chopin's third ballad. I played it from the age of 14 to 16, two years on the same piece. Oh my God. Just a couple of other pieces. I actually couldn't play that piece for years afterwards. Um, and Kendall, Kendall Taylor, within the first week, I mean, the piece he gave me, the, the next lesson, he said, okay, come play. And I just started with one hand. He said, what, what are you doing? 
<laughs> and I said, well, but you know, that's how I've been learning things. That's how I would turn up to my next lesson or what. And he said, no, 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 I want to hear the whole piece. And, 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 he, and he didn't want to hear it at kind of baby speed. You, you know, he knew it wasn't going to be like f fully, fully ready. But he, I suddenly had to change not one gear, but about 10 gears. Thank goodness he did that, you know, because in this life you can't, I mean, it's such a kind of precious time, isn't it? To be able to spend forever learning things. It's, I mean, it's just great to be able to do that. But the real life is that you also need to get your skates on. Yeah. So, you know, in the ideal life we can do both, but you do need to know how to work fairly quickly. So I expect you you were um, had to kind of practice and immerse in this um, uh, pretty deeply, right? What a uh, menu in school or, or? No, no, later with uh, the RCM. So it sounds by by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I th I mean, <laughs> I think if I'm totally honest, in the first year I did as much as I needed to do to keep him happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If my students are listening, they're probably saying, ah, okay. So, <laughs> but it was a kind of, I didn't do more. I think that's what I'm trying to say. I, did, I didn't go over what I needed to do because I think I was on the rebound of being in this school where there was a lot expected and, and, a, huge, and a very long day and suddenly I had this freedom. Yeah. You know, I, I was living in London, I was 17, you know, and, and I had time and I had time to have fun and I'd never done all that. And um, so just suddenly to make that transition from having a very kind of organized schedule to then learning the skills of making your own schedule, which I think is always a challenge. Yes. You know, it's, it's a challenge for all of us and especially and especially now you know, during this time when there's no, there's no concert in front of you, mm -hmm. you know, how to handle that and what do you practice and should you be bothered and how to, how to use time that you've never had. Well, that so. was actually one of the questions. I mean, do you, uh, we've jumped at it and I hope that the listeners don't, don't mind, but since you touched it already. Um, so now, um, um, for those who don't have concerts, um, do you yeah. have a routine? Do you advise to just say, okay, I feel like I, I can have a sabbatical, I feel I can take a time off, or um, is, is there anything that sort of motivation-wise you would recommend or something? I, th I think motivation is something that I've spoken about quite a lot with my colleagues. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I've spoken about it obviously with students, so we can maybe come back to that, but but I think for some of us, it's very mixed reactions actually, because some people are really kind of happy to be at home. They've never had it. They've just always been on the run, you know, and it's, um, I mean, for myself, you know, I've been here now all through spring and I'm very lucky. I've got a really nice garden. I'm hopeless at gardening, I should say, but I just inherited this nice garden. I've never ever seen all the plants come out, all the flowers come out over spring and it's absolutely delicious but then you sort of think you know what about the piano when so in the first few weeks i didn't do very much and then i thought oh you know maybe it'll be nice to to learn this i never actually learned it and now i have time i don't have i don't have to perform it either because usually once you get very busy in the profession it's very difficult to find the time to learn things that you then won't perform sure of course so i i felt i wanted to make the most of that so i've i've learned some pieces maybe not up to total what i would say i want to perform them next week but i've actually opened music i've been meaning to look up for a long time and that's been really nice but i find that i don't have much routine with any of it and i think normally i've been i'm quite a disciplined person with my work and I always felt some of that came back to menu in school at like having practice times and it, it took me a long time to feel that I could get past 10 o'clock in the morning and and if I hadn't started my practice I would feel bad you know that kind of thing and now sometimes a couple of days has gone by and I haven't been on the piano and I, but I'm not feeling bad about it it's fine it's okay 
I just think I, I'm, I'm allowed to be like that and that's how it is. But in a way, um, I'm also missing not playing quite as much as I used to. So it's a kind of double, yeah, sure. it, it's the double sided coin really. Um, so I go in waves with it and I don't know how many other people are, are finding things, but I find my energy level is very up and down. Yeah. Uh, and I'm usually a very energetic person, but some days I feel unbelievably tired and I'm not quite sure why. I, I'm not sick and I haven't ha had the virus, but I think it's also the kind of just our surroundings. You know, if I read too much news, I get really tired oh, sure. because it's a lot to take on, isn't it? You know, and, and I'm a really optimistic kind of person. So to just keep that energy going the whole time it has been a little bit hard work but I've, I've tried to pass on some energy to students that might need some motivation <laughs> um you mentioned you're a very disciplined person and it may come from many in school so um what is your routine what 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 used to, what it used to be when you let's say were a teenager and then also a young let's say pianist working towards pieces new pieces well, I think I've always been somebody that liked to work in the morning, although I'm a really late night person, but I, ne <laughs> um, I never wanted to start my practice in the evening because I sort of thought, oh, no, no, I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather be seeing my friends or out or, or I, had, I had a family when I was very young also. So, um, you know, when my daughter was coming back from school, I didn't want to go off and practice. I wanted to have had that done. So I think I always felt kind of somehow in my head that I have this magic number of 10 o'clock. I thought it was kind of civilized time to be starting work. And if it got after that, I thought I really needed to get on with it. Um, I think apart from the time that I prepared for Leeds piano competition, I've never practiced as much as I did then. Mm -hmm. So I probably, you know, this, there was so much repertoire to get through. I probably was one of those kind of six, I don't know if I practiced seven hours. I, I, don't, I wasn't kind of counting, but I know it took the whole day and probably into the evening. I'd, I've never, uh, I'm trying not to, I'm trying not to tell lies here. I, I think probably in the very early part of my career, I still practiced a lot. Mm -hmm. because I had so much new repertoire to learn. I had to learn an awful amount very quickly um, just because there were so many concerts coming very fast after the competition. But I think in later life, I thought I really don't want to be somebody sitting at a piano for six hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I feel that I've maybe tried to... I, and I, I've had a few people make comments on, on me saying that. Because, because especially as a pianist, there is so much repertoire to learn. And yes, of course, you can be practicing six or seven hours a day without any issues because we, we've always so much to get our heads and our hands around. But I do also think we waste some of the, those hours. Yes. Some of it's not really focused. And I think some of sometime you could actually just sit with a cup of coffee and, and look at the score and learn some things that way you don't actually have to be of course you have to be super fit there's no two ways about that we are like athletes and we have to keep in shape mm -hmm. mentally physically everything but i'm i can only speak for myself sure no but it's fascinating and then you mentioned that you decided to take time off um, that's very interesting. So how, how old were you and what exactly prompted you to, to do that? Um, I, th I think what you're referring to is um, about three years after uh, my prize in the Leeds competition. Uh, and I think it was just simply burnout. Okay. I mean, I, you know, it was a, a huge transition and this is what everybody needs to remember when they enter competitions that if they happen to do well and it kind of takes them by surprise, you need to be ready for the next stage. And, and it, it, was, it was just a, 
that was a moment I really wasn't ready for. And I went from no concerts to like 80 or 90, which has been kind of well documented before. But it, after three years of that, I just couldn't cope, basically. So too, too many new pieces, too much stress, which, you know, you, you, need, you need to practice how to handle stress to some degree. And some of that, you know, so it's, it, while it should have been an exciting time, it was exciting for a while and then it just became hugely stressful. Right. And I actually, by the third year, started to think I'm actually really not enjoying this. What's wrong? And I had, I really didn't have, at that time I died, I really didn't have somebody to talk to about it. So I think that's also something that's important for any young performer. That if you're going through any kind of, traumatic time like that or doubting yourself or you really just need to discuss that with somebody try to have somebody that you can go to maybe somebody a little bit more experienced that can just help you through the, those tricky times because I, I i just really felt totally lost and then I, I felt slightly not a failure in any way but i just thought well i've been through all this since i was five and now I've got to this point and I don't enjoy it. What's wrong with me? But actually, what, there was nothing wrong with me. It was just simply I, I was doing too much too soon. And nobody had helped me to say no. <laughs> so um, it, was, it was just the way it was. It wasn't anybody's fault. It was just a combination of events. Everybody, you know, wanting me to have all those concerts. Yeah. And me wanting them because it's a wow, you know, amazing. You know, I'm going to play with the London Symphony Orchestra next week. And the week after that, I'm going to play with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. And there'll be two different concertos. But who cares? That's fine. I can learn that one. And then I can learn one, you know. So it, there are lots of people like me, I think, where, where things, stuff has happened. And the, the thing is to learn from these stories. And the good thing is, you know, look, I'm still, I'm still here 40 years later. So I, survived my, I survived my little crisis. Well, I think it's also very important what you mentioned. There is almost like no one to talk about. And I must say, I really feel it. And I think um, I felt it when I was also graduating, um, really wanting to talk to someone like what's next although you know I've won competitions and then but and and I think actually partly that we're doing this series now is I find that the musical community is not open enough you, you don't really hear people talking much about the experience and the experience can be very very it's not just you know I I'm now performing at the I don't know Wigmore Hall Carnegie Hall and things but there's sure. so many ups and downs and people don't kind of know about them so yeah I I th yeah, and I think particularly now with social media, everybody, everybody wants to kind of say, oh, I'm really excited. You know, I'm really excited. I'm going to be playing blah, blah, blah. And probably they are. But nobody says, I'm scared to death. Mm. You know, because <laughs> just we don't do that. But actually people need to know that people are, are, are anxious or... or having some doubts it's it's normal it's part of our kind of our little battles that we have with ourselves and how to get how to get around that you know the whole, whole subject of nerves or what it's like to perform or there's kind of stress there, there's a certain kind of little stress level that's with you kind of almost constantly and it's how to handle that and it's how to handle that in real life and leave it leave it at a certain time you know so you're not thinking about these things 24 7. Um, and so can I ask you about your comeback how I mean and actually firstly how did people react when you say when you said I, I, I need a pause um, so, well, the so thing is, I, Julia I didn't I didn't oh Julia sorry I didn't say I want to pause I said I'm stopping full end wow so uh, and i kind of yeah i did mean it so i asked my agent to just cancel everything wow and he was very patient because he he, he knew probably i would change my mind and he was right 
So then I called him again, like four, four months later and said, actually, maybe should, let, let, let's try again. But help me to say no. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important lesson. It's still hard now, you know. Well, it's not so, it's not so hard, right, that, you, you know, in the latter years. But it's, I, th I think when you're kind of, you've got all that excitement in front of you, you've got all these dates you may have dreamed of, it's, you get up to a point where you think, oh yeah, I've got enough. I've got enough concerts on. I, I really don't have time to practice, because we have to have that time to prepare. And you might want to have time to have a life. Let's not forget that. It's also pretty important. And sometimes the balance is just doesn't go together. And you, then you get that call that somebody says, but please, can you do this? And you say, oh, please don't ask me even. You know, I don't have time for this or whatever it might be. And, and then it's very hard. It's really hard, especially if it's your friends that are asking you to do things too. Well, sure, but, sure. You know, that's just a learning. It's just a learning curve, and you and you learn how to say. You do have to learn how to say no, and sometimes you you take the plunge and can do a little bit extra than you thought you could. But that takes experience to weigh up. You know what the co what the cost personal cost is. Um, let's talk about your uh, wonderful co collaboration with Yo Yo Ma. Yeah. Um, um, so tell us about him a little bit. I, I mean, I, I su suppose he's uh, as nice in life as he's on the stage. He just has this aura of being your sort of best friend immediately. Yeah, I think he is. That's exactly how he is. And that he is exactly like that in real life. So um, I, I think you know, he's one of the most generous in spirit. Well, in all ways. But, you know, he has a, the biggest heart and generous nature. And I think he's, a, he's one of the world's sharers. You know, he wants to share. So I remember when we first started working together, of feeling very much about, you know, worried about myself and what I was doing and everything. And he, you know, you've seen him play. It's, it's always like... Yeah. open you know even the way he's sitting and I learned so much just from this kind of attitude of give of giving because sometimes it's not always about giving it's about well this is what I do come come, come to me and you can say at the same time about drawing in your audience so the, you know there is value to that also but there is something about also just kind of opening your heart and uh, uh, and your whole body language and say okay let, let, let's go on this journey together so i think we've yeah wow we've had such a super long partnership now i forget i even begin to forget how many years it is it's 34 five something i i don't know it's a long time but we've had many kind of musical adventures together and that's been great because i think we're fundamentally both explorers and not frightened to try something you know a little bit out of our comfort zone so apart from you know we we've played m most of the core repertoire for cello and piano but we've been keen to work with people who have taught us so much about music we we knew nothing about and we've done that together and i think that's been great so yeah, we're, I'm very incredibly fortunate um, to have a musical partner like that. But uh, it's always, we always start from, we always start again, you know, when we see each other. We don't just say, oh yeah, well, well, you know, we've been doing this years, that's fine, let's just pick up. But that is kind of in the, it's in the bank, isn't it? You know, those experiences. Has there been something um, that you particularly remember, like a, maybe a fun occasion or something, uh, something where maybe some a strange occasion, you know, together with him? I'm sure that I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure there have been hundreds of them. Um, of course, I can't think of anything particular now. You you've said it, but <laughs> oh wow! I, I you know Yulia, I don't know. It's just been we've just been together for sort of so long. 
Um, but I, no, it's just been like one of life's magical adventures and, and it doesn't stop. You, you know, we're, we're planning another recording now and um, who, who knows where we will be. We always say we will kind of see each other still to the end somehow. If we can get on that stage, we will be there. Um, but I think, look, what's important for me is that I'm incredibly happy, you know, I'm incredibly lucky to, to work with a person like that, but also chamber music in general is so important mm -hmm. to me. And I've always had a kind of, I've, I've often tried to make decisions thinking, do, do I want to just play chamber music? Or I've sometimes felt too lonely when I've been mm -hmm. playing solo recitals. Um, and when I've played concertos, I've wished sometimes that it would feel like chamber music. On a really great day, it can do, you know, when you've got all those elements, because there's so, the, the amount of elements are, are so huge, aren't they? You know, when you come to, to concerto playing. But there's something magical about having dialogues with people through music that ho hopefully other people can understand these conversations. Um, um, it's a fascinating, it's a f fascinating fine lines that you that you have. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, what you've just uh, mentioned anyway. So being lonely as a concert pianist, because I don't think many people really understand what's it was it like uh, to be always on the road in a hotel and always sort of changing, um, you know, places and not really seeing those places. Um, so I guess you are not, you know, as happy on your own as, let's say, other pianists who don't seem to need anyone. And if you're a sociable person, um, so how did you cope with, with this uh, sort of always on the road alone, uh, make a play a recital and then just next? Yeah, yeah. I, I think in earlier years, I found that pretty difficult. I'm actually quite good with my own company. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, I, I, I'm sort of highly sociable, but I know exactly how to function on my own. And I don't need to be talking to somebody 24 hours a day. Um, but it can be very lonely because you, the, I, th I can just remember in the early days, especially when you don't know so many people, of course, now we're all connected by our phones and the computers and goodness knows what. But, you know, in the early days, you go and play somewhere and maybe that was it at the end of the concert. Nobody said, would you like to come for a drink or anything? And you just kind of go back to your hotel room and you don't know anybody. And that's a kind of, that can be a real downer. You kind of, maybe if you were lucky, there was a mini bar and... <laughs> You could see if there's a packet of peanuts in there or something, but um, yeah, it can, it can, it can just be. I can remember a very well known. I'm not going to say who it is, but a very well known pianist. And I was on tour in Japan, and I got this note delivered to the. Somebody delivered a note to the hotel, and they said. I've been here for two weeks. I'm so lonely. I don't know anybody. And they were giving really big concerts and this and that. But they said, could we just meet for coffee? Wow. And I didn't actually know this person, but of course we were related by our profession. And sure, that's what we did. But, you know, wow. the, I think that nobody would have guessed that that was happening. Yeah. So I think... I think for people traveling now, it's much easier to stay in touch. You know, look, you know, you can FaceTime somebody and, and, and you, you, it's easier to relate to, to call back home and things like that. that. That I found hard in the early days. You know, you were on the other side of the world and you couldn't just like send a text message. It just wasn't. I mean, I'm so ancient. That's how it was. But um, it, so it is easier, I think. But there's. It's really, I've always found it really great to be traveling with somebody. It's just fun, you know. There's always so much boring time at the airport and everybody can say, yeah, we, it's time to read and this and that. But 
sometimes it's just nice to have a chat with somebody, you know. Fantastic. Um, and um, may I ask you um, a rather personal question? Or you, I know you had a, you mentioned as well. You had a family uh, mm. when you were, let's say, at the height of your uh, career. So how how was that? Um, I, I think especially for women pianists, that's a very kind of hot topic, actually. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I uh, I have a daughter, and I'm about to be a, a grandmother um, this month. So, uh, yeah, oh God, it was extremely difficult. It was extremely difficult. Uh, I mean, I had her when I was 25, so um, I was still very, very busy. Um, it's interesting you say at the height of my career because I'm. I'm not sure I ever had a height of my career, but I, don't, I certainly don't think of it then. But I was really trying to kind of be all, all, all parts, you know, um, wife, mother, whatever. And you have a, I think leaving a child is, is one of the hardest things to do anyway, in any profession. I mean, there's lots of people not in music profession that have to leave their children to go to work. And it's pretty, it, it's, it's never easy. I, I never really got used to it, but it's what I had to do. And in the early days, I, I took her with me. So that also has its stresses because you then have to bring somebody else. Um, and I, I think there were a lot of times, you know, I can remember before I was about to play something thinking, oh, I wonder if what if my my husband has remembered that you know she needs this for school the next day or this you know your brain is suddenly working in many different parts so but look i always say everything is possible and um it's it just i think then the kind of organizing of my time came really in really useful so I made that kind of little rule to myself that when she was back from school, that would be it. I would be mum. And I wouldn't say I have to go and practice. Mm -hmm. And I thought I should be able to manage that. I, if I remember rightly, she was, uh, that meant being finished with my work at 3.30. So I started in the morning, like I told you, or whatever. And, and I worked solid till then. And that was it. And I absolutely made that. I mean, maybe, you know, once or something, there was a total emergency, but I, I wasn't somebody who, when I was mum, I was mum. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I just try, I tried my best to, to kind of carry that through. I, I'm sure I wasn't successful the whole time, but mm. yeah. Yeah. No, but I just think for women is, um, and I'm, I, I hope that everyone understands me, forgives me, but it's harder actually, especially uh, traveling and, and just being at everywhere <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to say it's harder because somebody will hmm. kind of freak out and say, yeah, but it's just as hard for the guys. But it, it, it is pretty hard. It, it, it is pretty difficult. But I just, you know you can do it but then again you have to sort of think how much do you want to be away so you have more decision making um to do and so maybe i can remember one summer holiday when uh, so i guess she was at school and then the summer holidays were maybe six weeks or something and i thought i'm really going to try not to go away through throughout her whole summer holidays and um, I remember getting really itchy feet after about sort of three weeks because I was then, you, you know, just, just fairly constantly traveling. Um, so, you know, I was always trying something. And I remember she said to me once, why aren't you like all the other mums um, from school? And I said, what do you mean? Feeling like, oh my, oh, this sounds bad. And she, uh, she said, you're, you're always going away. You're the only one that does that. And I, I mean, it was pretty hard to hear that from a seven-year-old. And then, I, I mean, I was trying to think really quickly, you know, how, how I can kind of explain this. And then I thought, you know what? Lots of other mums, when it is their summer holidays and whatever, they're packing the kids off to grandma or something because they're carrying on working through all this. So that was my kind of saving line but there's never an easy way to say it and then you just hope your child at some point gets it um 
Very interesting. Can I talk about um, you and um, your um, curated programs? You have uh, been extremely busy and extremely innovative with your programming and um, all sorts of things, really beautifully put together programs. Um, so when did this start? Because, of course, usually, I mean, as I understand correctly, um, it's it's not that someone asks you to create a program. At least, you know, you can you can put together something, and it doesn't matter if it's kind of just random pieces. But how did you get into uh, curating a sort of specially themed projects? Um, I think by being really determined that something would happen. That was the first one, and that was in 1995, which was the... 150th anniversary of Gabrielle Fauré, and who, who's a really kind of composer very close to my heart. And I, I just thought, you know, nobody's doing very much for him. <laughs> you know, everybody does lots for, for Mozart and for Beethoven and, and, and other such great composers, of course. Um, and I thought, poor Fauré, it's sort of getting lost here. Um, and then I, I just had that thought and then thought to myself, well, what would I do? What would I do if I wanted to kind of celebrate him? So I went off down this French track of programming and the next minute I had 12 concerts all written out on a piece of paper. I mean, not perfect, but you know, a kind of outline. Four orchestral concerts and eight um, chamber or recitals. And I couldn't leave this idea alone. I mean, that's how stubborn I can be. So the idea was there and I thought, oh, you know, I have to do something with this. So I, st I started kind of knocking on a few doors. I went to see a friend of mine at the BBC Philharmonic, Trevor Green, and said to him, look, you know, I've had this idea about four orchestral concerts and I'd worked with them a lot by then and they knew me, thank goodness actually actually listen to me and 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 then i was thinking oh god this is all going to cost money that was the like who can, who can i get to play and it's all going to cost money and how's this going to work and the next minute i made it well not the next minute it was a lot of work i made it work so i did raise the money and i did find the right people and um oh all kinds of wonderful artists came and played um, and there you have it so there were the foray and the french connection was my first festival 12 concerts um i think actually yeah yo, -Yo played jean yves Thibaudet came and played um nash ensemble were there all, all kinds of people it, it was fantastic jan pascal tortelli was conducting we had a, we had a brilliant time it was great, it nearly killed me. It absolutely nearly finished me off because I'd never done anything like that. I was seen outside a concert hall dishing out leaflets kind of with a big hat on like, you know. <laughs> I did everything. I had the, the, the program designed. Um, so I, I suddenly learned what it was to put on a concert from, literally I always said from the kitchen table. And it was one of the best lessons of my life because I do think a lot of us go and perform and take for granted a little bit all what goes on to actually make that event happen. And somebody's been sweating over that for, for weeks, months, years sometimes. Yeah. And raising the money and everything. So um, I think the big lesson that I did learn was... I, I did put some personal investment in that and I thought I must never do that again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that's way, that, that, that brings it into the family, that brings it into everything. So that was my lesson. And from that, um, Bridgewater Hall in the year 2000 asked me to put on a festival, mm -hmm. I think kind of based on, on that. And then I created a festival of two weeks with about 50 events, all based around the piano. Just by chance of piano, I gave them three things. I think one was Latin American music, one was Celtic, something or other. And the piano, I thought, oh, they won't go for the piano. It's, it's maybe not exotic enough or something. And that's what we did. 
So that, that was the start and I, I've done lots since and I really love it. And um, as you know, at the moment, I'm artistic director of the Australian uh, Festival of Chamber Music. And there's about 46 artists come and about 30 events, 30 concerts. And that's really mix and match kind of chamber music. So you will never have a whole concert of string quartet or violin and piano. It's all mixing. But I totally love it. And I like discovering music that I knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. And uh, the internet is fantastic for that because you can really explore to your heart's content much easier than years and years ago where you had to, you weren't sure what the piece was or how, how to listen to it and had to buy endless recordings. Um, so you mentioned um, this, of course, huge festival and it's a very famous festival. Um, how has this been affected by the current situation? Oh, hugely, because um, we should have been having the festival this year in um, end of July into August. And a couple of months ago, I, well, when I told you I was in, at the beginning of this interview, when I told you I was in Australia, I was out there launching the festival program and traveling around Australia and, uh, you know, tickets were on sale and everything was, was going great. And then the anxiety <laughs> started. And then I was told that the board would make a decision in, I can't remember now, but I think April. And I thought, oh, that seems too early. You know, it seems, you know, let's wait, let's wait, let's wait. And then it seemed absolutely obvious that they had to make a decision. So I was just panicking that the decision would be to cancel. Mm -hmm. So I'm hugely relieved that it was postponed and we will do it uh, oh. next year, which is fantastic because you know, on a personal level, it was going to be my final festival. So oh. I thought, well, this is just going to be the worst way to go out. I had a three year contract and this was the final one. So I thought this is awful. You know, you kind of build up these relationships with people. You, you need to kind of say goodbye, if nothing else, or until the next time. And also, you know, it's a massive uh, amount of work to just kind of disappear i mean losing one concert is bad enough losing a whole festival is enough is, is kind of on a it's different but it was equally devastating and also 46 musicians like you know you feel some responsibility to help them so i'm really thrilled that it will happen in 2021 of course one or two people can't join us because of other plans already but it's been fantastic to to be able to shift that. What would be your words for, you know, uh, younger audiences, or maybe not younger, maybe for anyone who is sort of struggling now, any words of wisdom? Did you say audiences or? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's, let, let's start again. So uh, what would be your advice uh, to uh, all musicians listening to us now? Oh, wow. <laughs> it's quite difficult because, of course, at the moment, there's just such an unknown um, element to this whole situation. I, th I think my overriding advice is firstly, have faith. You know, I mean, just faith in what we do. Uh, that there, there will always be a voice for music. I, I do strongly believe that. But also to be, try to be flexible because it's i'm not sure how it will play out and it, it may take a very long time before things come back to normal but in the meantime we might have to be doing things in a slightly different way especially i mean you know not so much for pianists we're actually in a slightly lucky bracket in a way or, or the smaller ensembles but for our friends that are in orchestras and in opera and um, you know, this is, it, it's pretty serious. So, what you, you know, we need help, basically. That's, that's the first thing that needs to get out there. Um, we need help to keep, keep our profession and, and this wonderful voice that we can communicate with. We, we need help to keep this alive. But I think as, I think it's not motivation, but to try to keep the spirit 
try to keep the spirit in a good place for yeah. the future. Well, thank you very, very much for your time. It was a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Julia. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.